We're going piece by piece through Kane. Today we're doing Beehive, Storm Ending, and Theater by Gene Toomer. Beehive. Within this black hive tonight, there swarm a million bees. Bees passing in and out of the moon. Bees escaping out the moon. Bees returning through the moon. Silver bees intently buzzing. Silver honey dripping from the swarm of bees. Earth is a waxen cell of the world comb, and I, a drone, lying on my back, lipping honey, getting drunk with that silver honey, wish that I might fly out past the moon and curl forever in some far-off farmyard flower. I'm going to assume there are probably a lot of different ways you can take this one. <laughs> yeah, because uh, my brain automatically goes to history stuff, so I start thinking about what is the historical context of this because we've read so much of Kane so far and knowing Toomer and what he likes to write about. I'm going to probably go down a certain path very different from yours. So I would really like to hear what you thought of this one. Okay, okay. All right, so mine, I... I felt, first of all, like, what? <laughs> I'll put that out there in the beginning. And then I started to kind of think about this bee that's sitting there, just lipping honey, right? And everybody, I'm thinking about being a beehive and everything around's going crazy. It reminded me of when I first moved to Indianapolis, like downtown, like I moved downtown. The, the, the night that I moved in, I'm exhausted from like, a, a, what? Drove here four hours from Chicago, about eight hours of unpacking. It was a long day all by myself. My, my roommate hadn't moved in yet. And like, you have all these noises outside from the city. Everybody's walking around. I live next to a bar. So it was horribly loud that I didn't think about when I picked the place, but it made me, it made me think of that feeling, right? Where I'm in this city, I'm, I'm having this identity crisis. This is my first time out of college living on my own. And I'm literally in this big city by myself big, maybe not compared to Chicago, but big enough. It was a beehive, right? And <laughs> I, I just, there's, there's this weird, almost like existential, what am I going to do now? Right? There's all these people moving around. They've got friends. They're hanging out. I know no one in this town, right? I'm, I'm the lone drone sipping here. I oh, did not mean to rhyme that <laughs> on my honey. And, <laughs> nice. and everybody else has got things to do, places to go. And, and I don't, I don't know where I fit in yet. Right. That's that's how I related to this bee. And I kind of viewed the beehive as being the city where everybody else has things to do, circles. And, and I'm in this existential dread of not knowing what I'm going to do next. I love that interpretation, though. I love how personalized you made it. I wish I could have some type of experience to be able to look at that. But my brain immediately went to, OK, is Tumor trying to talk about a time in history when uh, there was slavery and that all of these drones, all these busy little bees doing their work, and that they're working at night underneath the, 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 the moon, and all seem the same, all are doing the same thing, and all they long for is like freedom. And I feel that the poem is really kind of two parts for me, is the first part is explaining the life of the drones, and the second part is the longing for freedom of the honey, because the honey is the sweet good stuff, and something that they can't have. Do you think you spent time looking back on the previous cycle of Cain and that influenced the way that you might interpret this piece? 1,000%. And as we've talked about so many times, it, it could be a usually a good thing, but sometimes a detriment to where it influences me too much is looking at the author themselves and looking how they t traditionally write and then applying that stigma over and over and over to all their pieces of work. When they're trying to branch out and do all different things, I have them locked into a box with my own uh, uh, preconceived notions of what they're going to write or what they're going to teach mm. me or what they're going to tell me. And I do feel like that I've done that for this one. And that may be because I just I struggled to understand the meaning like you. At, at the end of it, I was like, huh? Well, here's a, here's a useful tool that I found helpful going through the second cycle here is some critics, and, and it, there's no wrong way to read literature, right? But some critics like to point the, almost like the, the id, the ego, and the super ego in the three parts of Cain, where in the first part, it's about survival, right? The, the id, 
like the what what, the, what are the basic needs because that's perhaps some of that experience, particularly being a slave, or you you don't have the niceties or the ability to self-identify. You're you're being told what to do by your slave masters and such. Well, in the second cycle, maybe one way that might open a key to perhaps some of these sections here is to think about it from an ego perspective, where you're creating your identity. You have more freedom to build your life and what you're going to do next. And if we're looking at this, because if you remember, these are now Washington, D.C., right? So if we are going to contextualize it from a historical standpoint, again, uh, totally up to how you want to do that, you could look at it kind of like the Great Migration, where you had millions of, of now freed African-American, Black Americans moving north to the major cities, where you saw like a boom of 20% increase in some cities of Black populations in certain areas, right? And you had a huge increase of the amount of black Americans now in Washington, D.C. Well, what does that mean? What do I do now? What is my freedom? What is my happiness? What do I do with my time? As a lot of people are moving there to escape some of the oppression of the South, the legacy of slavery even, uh, to kind of go through this journey of, of what am, what is it going to, what's going to define me from here on out? And maybe that might be something to, for us to kind of explore as we go through some of these pieces. It just dawned on me, and maybe it's a stretch, but if you, if I look at this poem and think of the first part of pre-migration, the drones are all trying to get to the sweet honey, the moon, maybe Underground Railroad, moon, nighttime, had to try to sneak away at the night, and then kind of the second part of the poem is the drone has the ability to kind of just lazily do it whenever he chooses, because, you know, he's laying on his back, he's just kind of, you know, lipping at the honey, he can get the sweetness, the freedom whenever he wants, because things have changed. And I guess I could take it as almost as an evolution of what is happening in the South and the Great Migration pattern as it's changed over the late 1800s into the early uh, 20th century. Okay, okay. Let's, let's continue this into the next poem, Storm Ending, right? Thunder blossoms gorgeously above our heads. Great, hollow, bell-like flowers, rumbling in the wind. Stretching clappers to strike our ears. Full-lipped flowers, bitten by the sun. Bleeding rain, dripping rain like golden honey. And the sweet earth flying from the thunder. Ooh, honey! Are we sure we're not still in the bee poem? <laughs> <laughs> this one it confused me even more. I... I... I had no clue where to go with this one. I think there's a lot of metaphors in here. I do want to point out that I thought it was interesting the way the thunder blossoms, the way that nature has this. Thunder is not something that blossoms, but it uses a flower term to explain it. And there's another part where it says the flowers rumble. And again, a a flower doesn't rumble, but it's described as that. And then we have the rain falls like honey. So it's clear there's almost like these opposites, but they're still connected in a sense is one way to perhaps take a a thematic approach to this poem. I think another way is it's just kind of fun. I I feel like after the seriousness of part one of Kane, I feel like Toomer is just having more fun. Things are a little bit lighthearted and not to say the poem maybe not have some value for you. uh, This one just seems almost a little silly. Uh, that it's just something that you can, it, it, it's just words that are coming together that sound cool, that gives you a very pretty picture and imagery. Well, I think you can almost take a approach where we say, what does nature represent? What do, what does the blossoming represent? Is it, is it a future? Is it a new hope? You know, when we look at America at this point in time, and again, this is just a personal reading of it. You can read it the way you want. We kind of had two Americas in, in, in when you read history books, like obviously each historian's going to interpret it differently. But I remember I've read a couple where they talk about how America at this point in time could have been argued to be two totally separate countries in terms of like their hmm. well, well, but but specifically back then, because if you remember the levels of literacy, the levels of schools and education systems back then, uh, in terms of of work offerings, in terms of unemployment, huge difference. Between the South, which was recovering from this this complete shift in its economic model, to the North, right, which which had already been 
I mean, it seems too simplified to say more urban and more hip, like, <laughs> but, but there's, there's a huge difference in the North and the South at this point in time, but it's still one country. It's still connected. And the way I kind of took some of the nature elements of the flowers and the rumbling of the storm, but using the same words to describe each other, it made me reflect upon how America was kind of split, but we're still connected in a form of identity too. And there's that question of what's the future going to bring? In the future, typically in literature, storms represent uncertainty, unpredictability, that you can kind of take of a, a question of what will America become? It's the two different Americas in a sense. That, that makes me kind of think about if Toomer knew how much our country would change and stay the same all in one breath, I kind of feel like over the last hundred years to think about that the, the North and the South being different in so many regards, just not economically, um, you know, the diversity there, the language, the way we speak, uh, our accents, all very different. But you brought up a good point, I think, about uh, the technology as well. The North had surpassed, you know, and having the railroads and, uh, you know, you saw a lot more of electricity going up in the north and running water where the south was still struggling to get caught up with everything trying to hold on to those old roots of being you know an agrarian society and, and failing to do so and uh, I think that the poem uh, could kind of represent that as well the changing of the the tides of technology because it it brings vast change in itself like a storm would yeah. I honestly, I, I would have bet money and I, I obviously would have lost. I would have bet money that you were going to go the religious route, the that story where Jesus told the storm to stop, right? And to have faith about the future, basically. I think you can kind of maybe read into that a little bit about like, you know, this storm coming in, tumor worried about the future. What's what's the world, you know, what's America going to look like? And having the faith, the faith that the, 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 not necessarily religious faith, but the faith that the country will pull through. I almost wonder if you, I thought you were going to take that interpretation, but it sounds like not. Uh, I, I always forget to incorporate Toomer and the religion because he's, he does such a great job of disguising it. And I think he's one of those authors that, you know, unlike some other authors who read, you very much know their political stance, you know, their religious stance. It's very apparent, but that, but Toomer hides it very elegantly. And, and I, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting poem. Uh, now the last piece is theater, right? Now this is our prose piece. And again, not based on a female's name, but we do have a prominent female where for the first time, as opposed to kind of being the male interpretation and understanding of a female tumor lets us into Doris's thoughts a little bit. And we start to see her even start to question you know, what will John's future with me be like? So what's the what's the plot of this one? This is where we're at the Howard Theater. So again, Washington, D.C., in a area that is having a boom in African-American presence as people move up into the area. And there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of art, uh, both music. You've got dance in this one. Jazz, it, it, yeah, and Yeah. And when you read this, <laughs> did you think at all about Langston Hughes? Oh, my foot was tapping the whole time I was reading this, and I thought, man, that, ugh, imagine if, like, Toomer and Hughes had written a piece together or something or collaborated. Oh, that would have been magic. That would have been a miracle right there. Yeah. When we talk about the jazz of Langston Hughes' rhythm, I, I feel it. Like, I get it. You know what I mean? But it's still intellectualized. With Toomer, and that's not to say it's better. It's just for how it hit me. I I heard it. You know what I mean? It. I was in the club. I could feel, like you said, the foot tapping and smell the smoke in the air because smoking was still legal in bars back then. <laughs> but but for sure, there's a, there's a level of immersion here. And I still wondered, when you look at these two, what what are the things that are separating them? Like, why are these two lovers, like many of the lovers in Cain, destined to be separated? It's their like own insecurities or their own prejudices. It's themselves. They won't let themselves be happy. I was I was screaming at both of them the whole time. I'm just like, Ugh! like you're judging them and they're judging you, and you idiots could just be together if you would just see each other for who you who who each other is. I, I was I was so angry at these characters, but they are written how real people are because isn't that the truth of when we look at each other we start to build the narratives in our head of what we think someone else is thinking about us it is so true 
even in modern times. It brilliantly done. Yeah. Do you think there was a difference in class between these characters? Oh, for sure. John is obviously upper class and, uh, you know, touts, I think, his money around or it appears that way. Uh, and and you could see that there's probably a class division. And she's working, right? She's a dancer. That's not to say just because you use your body, you're lower class, but physical dancing, even a callback to kind of some of like those uh, African dance roots and such like that. The African jazz. There, there's a lot of uh, um, African-American art being portrayed in this piece, which is really nice. But I assume if you're performing, you're generally considered lower class in terms of your your income. Right. And I think there's even a hierarchy in there of if you're, you know, singing, that's maybe the highest playing an instrument. And then, you know, dancers are at the bottom. So she's probably, you know, lower rank amongst those that are in the performing hall as well. And the way that she looks at John, Doris, the way she describes John, it does feel like that she is almost mad at him that she has to look up to him. And that gives a more, uh, you know, menacing feeling that there is this uh, divide between them that is, you know, some type of maybe an economic nature or, or status because of what their jobs or roles are in the theater. A lot of times when we look at this, because maybe because this is planted in my head, but, you know, we, we have to look at Kane or at least inform our reading of Kane, I should say, that a lot of this is a racial conscious exploration. Did you associate either of these characters with a particular race? Yes, I'm definitely guilty of that. It felt to me that John was white and Doris is a person of color. Do you have any reason for that? It felt like it, it it felt like the way that John was leering after Doris of something that he couldn't have or that people were only able to have in the past, that he feels that their relationship is um, a, a forbidden love, mm. just feels like the a callback line. to, yeah. yeah, he's colorblind, a callback to the South of how people were able to take advantage of, you know, people of color. And we don't know, but historically the owners of, I believe the Howard theater it, are white, right? So, so if we are taking it in real time, I, I believe at this point in time, it was a white owner. Maybe that's too far of a stretch. What I kept coming back to is I don't know if I view John that way because they said his face was half orange from like some light. The rest of it was in a shadow. And I'm like, well, a lot of times when Toomer has used the word shadow in this, he's talked about the African-American experience. And later on, when Doris is in this reverie and she like snaps out and she sees John, his face is completely covered in the shadows. And I didn't know what that meant, right? Like, does that mean that he is just inaccessible to your point? Is there is there a line that she can't cross with him because of the racial boundaries and prejudice uh, that white people had, particularly at this point in time? Or was he inaccessible because of his economic and class standing? Of, of he's so wealthy, there's no way that he would get together with this, this dancer, even though they both were sitting there fantasizing about each other, even though the, even the people are telling them, oh, they're stuck up. Oh, there's no way that you'd get along with them. Like, she's, she's just not one that you can get along with. Yet that's both what they want. So to that point about is there really a divide here, is what what they can't get over their own heads to what your point was earlier, is that they were denying themselves perhaps happiness that they could have had, but they felt they didn't deserve. Oh, I also remembered, I, I think, to, to more of my point of why I felt the way I did about this story is John, when he's imagining her dancing, is having a, a, a smell, a scent, and it's uh, cane fields, which is, I think, obviously a callback uh, to the South. Uh, the way that he describes her, I think, with the lighting um, is the, again, inter my interpretation is more of a sunset, the closing, the end of the South and, and slavery, that, that, that people of color were no longer able to be able to be owned. 
and that that John will never have that. Um, you know that that that's something that he wants. Maybe not necessarily to own her, but he would have been able to quote be with her in in a different time period. It just felt like there was a lot of callbacks to the South here for for John when he was reminiscing over Doris, fantasizing about Doris. Yeah, that's a good point about her. Uh, was it her face was tinted like Canefield or scented? She also was described as having like a lemon face. So a lot there. But ultimately, the thing that I kept coming back to with her is also her dance. It's interesting that you bring up the dance because at the very end, they describe it as a dead thing. What well, What is dead? Is, is the South dead? Is this relationship dead? And the whole story seemed to be about life, right? It it had this peppiness of the music, and I love the jazz. And the way that, that Toomer writes this story has that musical feel to it where you're going to have your foot kind of tapping to it because it is very quick and precise, like jazz, but it's very random as well. That I think he did this intentionally. If you kind of look at the spacing of the sentences of short and long and short and long, it, it gets you in kind of this uncomfortable feeling but in a good way the way jazz music does it it's brilliantly written and i just i love this story it just i feel like every time we get to a new story it's my next favorite <laughs> oh really very cool so this is one of your favorites in kane so far all oh, by far there's just so much to it introspection of why do we judge other people why do we put these stories and narratives about other people in our heads when we shouldn't be uh, judging one another for what they look like judging each other for their jobs judging each other for their class the music of it this this if we still do ratings i, I maybe give this one a 10 i Very love this cool. story it was Very so good cool. so good all right, well, let's see if Mr. Toomer keeps it up for your experience, at least, as we head into the next three pieces of Kane. Check the playlist down below as we're traveling through this story by story. My name has been Una. Peace. Peace. <laughs>